back again at Tom Kennedy Science. I'm Dr. Tom Kennedy. Now today we're going to continue on how plants can transport materials from their roots to their leaves or from their leaves to their roots. At least most of the time, right? So the topic today is going to be on sugar transport. Now on our previous episode, we talked about water transport through the xylem. Now we're going to talk about sugar transport through the phloem. And for the longest time, I had a lot of difficulty in remembering the difference between xylem and phloem. And finally, somebody said, hey, Tom, you know, phloem, food, phloem carries sugars and other metabolites. Xylem carries the water. I hope that helps that you can remember phloem equals food. Now, now to understand how the phloem transports sugars, we need to understand the structure of the phloem. And then we also have to understand, guess what? Transport from osmosis to facilitated diffusion and active transport. Remember all that stuff from cell and molecular biology? When we learned about active transport and facilitated diffusion, we're gonna start to use that here to understand how the phloem gets loaded with sugars and how it moves from areas where they're making it to areas that need it. Hmm, sounds like sources and sinks, doesn't it? So here's the anatomy of a phloem. We have a sieve tube member, we've got a companion cell, and we have a sieve tube plate. Now think about this. The sieve tube member and the companion cells, they are alive at maturity, unlike the xylem that's dead. And there's a reason why. Even though the sieve tube element is mostly a hollow tube to transport stuff, it's still alive. But it lacks most organelles, it lacks nuclei. I mean, it's just a tube to allow stuff to move up and down. And then you have these plates, which are between the elements that are perforated to allow things to move through. And we also have a companion cell. Now, companion cells, we're going to learn. These things are really metabolically active and they're loaded with mitochondria. Loaded with mitochondria. A plant cell loaded with mitochondria. They're doing active transport. See, it's important here. So the phloem. This is showing the sieve tube member or sieve tube element and the companion cell. And these are the two types of cells that make up the phloem. And remember, they're alive because you have to load the phloem. You're doing active transport. You're doing work. The way you do work is you need a live cell to do that. So the sieve tube elements, like I said, these are conducting cells. And to make it efficient, they have very few organelles and very little cytoplasm. And then the companion cells, at least in angiosperms. Now remember, angiosperms, these are your flowering plants. You know, like grasses, trees that flower, like oak trees, sunflowers, roses. These are angiosperms. So a tree that's not an angiosperm would be like a cypress tree, a juniper, or a pine tree, or a fir tree, some type of conifer. But in the angiosperms, which represent the vast majority of species, they have these companion cells. And they're specialized, and they're right next to the sieve tube elements. And like I said, they're there to help load those sieve tube elements up. Now, are in the same, you have xylem and phloem in a vascular bundle. And phloem sap will remain in the same vascular bundle. So let's talk about this transport. Okay, plants, you guys, everybody's got their own terminology here. I'm going to just introduce you to it because you might see this elsewhere. And it's always good to be introduced to these words. I won't use them that much. But there's translocation, which is a transport of photosynthase through the phloem. Okay. You know, I like saying the word photosynthate. I could also say secondary metabolites or metabolites. But photosynthates, these are organic molecules that the plant makes. That includes the sugars, like glucose, and it also includes all of these other things that the plant makes after the carbohydrates. Those are called 
secondary metabolites. So you know when you look at a pretty flower and it's got pigments, the blue one being anthocyanin, that is a secondary metabolite. Um, do you like to cook with herbs and spices? I know I love oregano and thyme and rosemary. Those flavors in our herbs and spices, those are also secondary metabolites. And like I said, they're called secondary because they're made after your carbohydrates like glucose, which would be a primary metabolite. And plants, of course, make thousands and thousands of secondary metabolites. Now in your phloem, the phloem is gonna move photosynthates. It's gonna move stuff the plant is making from where it's making it, which is the source, to where it's needed, the sink. So, you know, you've got rapidly growing plants. If you've got a root, well, of course, it's always gonna be a, almost always gonna be a sink. If it's not photosynthetic and it's growing, it needs energy, it's a sink. Young branches with new leaves, the leaves may not be fully photosynthetic or they're not producing enough to sustain their growth. So rapidly growing leaves and limbs, they could also be a sink. And then of course, your mature leaves that are in full sunlight doing lots of photosynthesis, that would be a source. So there's your sources in your sinks. Uh, roots are almost always sinks. Any type of structure used for storage, like a potato, yum, onion, garlic, bulbs, those are all gonna be sinks as well. So how do we do this? How do we move stuff from the phloem, you know, from the source to the sink? Well, there's this pressure flow hypothesis, and this was proposed by a guy named Ernst Munch in 1926. Um, don't confuse Ernst with, with Edvard. Because of course, Edvard Munch is incredibly infamous for the scream from 1893. And it symbolizes the anxiety of the human condition. And this is one of the most iconic paintings in the world. So let's get back to this pressure flow hypothesis. The phloem sap is moving from high potential to low potential. So here's how it works. You've got these companion cells. Remember I told you they're full of mitochondria? They're doing active transport. In this case, they're actively transporting sucrose into the phloem. Now sucrose is hydrophilic. It's water loving. As you put sucrose into the phloem, it lowers water potential. So the water is gonna flow out of any cell adjacent to the phloem because it's gonna move from high to low. Now, if you've looked at your vascular bundles, what's right next to your phloem? The xylem, right? And the xylem's carrying water. So as the companion cells pumping glucose or sucrose actually into the phloem, lowering water potential, guess what? Water will flow from the xylem into the phloem. And as it flows into the phloem, you're in a tube that creates pressure and it forces the water away from the area where it's being loaded. It's forcing the water away from the source and pushing it to the sink. And this is an example of turgor pressure. Now, of course, as this happens, all right, we're creating positive pressure in the phloem and it's gonna move that phloem sap to the sinks, but it's also creating negative pressure in the xylem which is cool because then the water will continue to flow up the xylem to these areas where it's needed. Okay, now this is what happens next. We're gonna move the sucrose to a sink, like a potato or an onion or in a root that's rapidly growing. And what's gonna happen now is that as we offload that sucrose, water potential inside the phloem is gonna increase. And as it increases, because we're removing the sucrose, all right, water will flow out of the phloem back into the xylem and will be transported back up the tree. So the water is actually moving around between the xylem and the phloem and back to the xylem again. And it's pretty smart how this works. Now there's some interesting implications here. You see the phloem 
is under positive pressure. That's important. So we got aphids. You know, there's some really interesting thing about aphids and ants here. But aphids feed on the phloem sap. You have probably seen aphids. And in fact, if you have a flower garden, you may have put stuff on your plants to remove the aphids or at least release some ladybugs on there to eat the aphids. Now aphids are a true bug. What's a true bug? It's a type of insect. Not all insects are true bugs. It's actually an order of insects called Hemiptera, which means half wing. I won't get too much into it here, but aphids feed on phloem sap and they have this tiny little mouth part called a rostrum. And what they do is they jam it into the phloem. The phloem's under positive pressure. These little mouth parts are like a straw. This got like pressure on it. So could you imagine you've got a straw, water's flowing out of the straw and into your mouth. Well, these aphids, they can't control it. So the water just constantly flows through them, right? And this water is full of sugars. They only need some of it and then they just lose the rest. Now, do you think this sugar water coming out their rear ends is gonna go to waste? No way, it does not. It gets eaten by ants. Ants are drinking sugar water from the butts of these aphids. I know, isn't nature wild? It's actually a symbiotic relationship. The aphids are easy targets for any prey, like a ladybug. So these ants, they're the protectors of these aphids. They'll protect the aphids against predation. And in return, they get some sugar water from the aphid butt. Now, okay, I can't help myself, but there's two really cool stories here in addition to this symbiotic relationship. Aphids reproduce by parthenogenesis. I know, crazy sounding word, parthenogenesis. But basically, a lot of them are females. They don't need sex to reproduce. They produce genetically identical offspring. And aphids, like these babies, many aphids are born pregnant with the next generation. I know, weird. And that ant, that ant is a female. And she is diploid. And the males are haploid. They only have one copy of their genome. You know, you and I, our sex is determined by our X and our Y chromosome. And ants, you're diploid if you're female, and if you're male, you're haploid. So the males, they don't have fathers, but they have grandfathers. I know, I think I said that in a previous lecture today. So it's kind of cool. Okay, so the next question now is how does a companion cell load a sieve tube element? And to understand this, we gotta know a little bit about active transport, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. And I like to go over these concepts several times, you know, maybe once in each lecture, because they're really important for us to understand. And sometimes, you know, I don't know about you, it takes me several times to learn stuff. I don't often get things the first time through. So let's just review our transport. Diffusion. You're just going from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. You're going down the concentration gradient. You don't need any specialized proteins and the cell does not have to use any energy, okay? It's using the kinetic energy that's already present in the system. You have to have kinetic energy to have diffusion. Diffusion is movement. Kinetic energy is the energy of movement. If you have no movement, you have no diffusion. It's a question I always like to ask on tests. Do, uh, does diffusion require energy? And the answer is absolutely. You just don't have to add any energy. Now we have facilitated diffusion. This requires some type of channel protein to allow your molecule to pass through the membrane. Or you might need some type of carrier protein that will carry your whatever it is through the membrane. Now these are facilitated. They're not requiring energy. And then we also have what is called active transport. Active transport is when you move a solute against its concentration gradient. So we're moving it from areas where there's less of it to areas where there's more of it. This requires two things, an input of energy and some type of pump or carrier to do this. It's like uh, you can think of facilitated diffusion or diffusion 
It's like placing a ball on top of the hill. Let the ball go, it rolls down on its own. Potential energy is transformed to kinetic energy. That's what happens in diffusion. In active transport, imagine a ball at the bottom of a hill. One thing that will never happen. That ball will never, ever, 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 from now to the end of time, roll up that hill unless you kick it, right? You have to have an input of energy to, to do that, and you need something to actually move it. In this case, you need a protein, whether it's a pump or some type of symporter or antiporter. Now, symporters and antiporters are a type of co-transport. So one thing that you're going to find out as you watch more of my lectures on this subject is I love proton pumps. In a proton pump, you can pump protons across a membrane and you create an electrochemical gradient. The electrical part of that gradient has to do with they're positively charged. So you build up a positive charge on one side, a negative charge on the other. The chemical part of that gradient, well, I've got more protons on one side than the other. So we call that an electrochemical gradient. That is potential energy the cell can use to do work. So now that I've got an electrochemical gradient, I've got more protons on one side. Now we can use them as a symporter. They want to go down their concentration gradient to be in equilibrium with the other side of the membrane. So a symporter is a type of protein that will allow the proton to diffuse, facilitated transport, diffuse through the membrane. But sim means with. So it's going to take the solute with it and it will drag that solute against its concentration gradient. So we're doing the work, facilitated the fusion, right? That's got kinetic energy and that kinetic energy is harnessed to drag a solute against its concentration gradient. So that's a symporter, an antiporter works in the opposite direction. So an antiporter, the proton goes or your co-transporter goes one way and then your solute goes the exact opposite way. And these are examples of co-transport. And plants use all of these. So companion cells actually use a symporter to load themselves up with sucrose. So your sucrose is being made inside your mesophyll cells, right? And we want to load our companion cells up. I know we talk about phloem loading, but bear with me here. What this companion cell is going to do is use a symporter. It's going to basically generate a proton gradient right outside of the companion cell. Now we've got an electrochemical gradient. So those protons will go through the symporter, dragging the sucrose with it into the companion cell. Okay. Now we've loaded the companion cell up with sucrose. That means there's more sucrose inside the companion cell than inside the phloem. Well, it's going to go from high to low, right? So then the sucrose will then flow into the phloem down its concentration gradient and will flow into the phloem through plasma desmata. So in this diagram here, you can see that you've got your mesophyll cells, you've got your bundle of sheet cells, and I haven't talked too much about those, so you need to go back and watch some of my lectures on photosynthesis, but the bundle of sheet cells are basically the, the cells surrounding the vascular tissue. And photosynthesis is taking place in both of them. And in a C3 plant, they're all making you know, carbohydrates and you're using the secondary co-transport to move the sucrose into the companion cells. And then once they're in the companion cells and they're completely loaded up, they then flow into the phloem through the plasma desmata. Now it's important to know that we're using the secondary co-transporter, the, the symport, to get the sucrose into the companion cells and then from there it goes into the phloem. Now we've loaded up the phloem. The phloem uh, is going to go under pressure because you've got water flowing in from the xylem because we've lowered the water potential and we move it. Now, now the sucrose can passively be transported into the companion cell from the sieve tube element and then into the other cells that are the sink. The reason why this can be passive, because there are sinks. There's less of the sucrose down there. Now, if you've got a storage structure, a potato, an onion, or even part of the root that's going to store a lot of carbohydrates, one of the places that you store carbohydrates is in a vacuole. So now we've got to load the vacuole 
guess what? We need active transport one more time. And we're going to use a co-transporter. Now, unlike the companion cells that are loading the phloem up way up top wherever your source is, you're using a symporter there. Here, you're going to use an antiporter. But guess what? You're still generating a proton gradient. How cool is that? Here's our proton pumps being used again, in this case, as an antiporter. On the membrane of the vacuole are proton pumps, and it's pumping protons into the vacuole. You're actually lowering the pH of the vacuole, which is kind of cool. Then you've got your antiporter, a type of co-transport, active transport, right? So by pumping the protons in there, once again, here's your electrochemical gradient. And then the protons flow out of the vacuole into the cytoplasm. And as they flow out through the antiporter, that brings in a molecule of sucrose and you load your vacuole up with sucrose doing active transport. In addition to carrying sucrose, which if you remember sucrose, it's a dimer. It's just a molecule of glucose and fructose stuck together. So it's two little simple carbs. The phloem is also an information conduit because plants are multicellular organisms, right? They're multicellular. You have to have communication between all the different cells of the plants. And one way you can do that is you can send chemical signals and you can send it through the phloem. And remember, to study up and remember all your different types of transporters, because as I continue talking about plant form and function and move into animal form and function, you're gonna see that these transporters are very, very important. Okay, until next time, this has been Tom Kennedy Science.